Hi, welcome to part two of our discussion on defamation. In our first part of defamation, when we watched the video, I'm sure you understood most of the things that we were speaking about. In the first part of the video, we focused principally on the definition of defamation. What is defamation per its definition? We reviewed some of the common law principles and how those principles had crystallized into the Ghanaian law. Remember, we said that in defamation, there is an action or a statement that inspires ridicule, hatred, or contempt against the complainant or the claimant. Or it is of such a nature that it reduces the person the estimation of right-thinking members of the society generally. Remember at that point that we explained that when we mentioned the right-thinking members of the society, the test is the reasonable man, the person who is not fettered by an understanding of the legal constructions of words. How will a reasonable person construe such a statement or action? This we saw was the test of a right thinking individual. Then also we said that if it constituted an imputation to a person's calling, trade or vocation, such that we impute incompetence, we impute criminality and things of such nature, it all can be classified as defamation. Now, in this video, in the second part, we are now going to look at the elements of defamation defamation. That is, if a matter has been brought up to court where one party A is alleging that another party B has defamed him, what are the things that he ought to prove in court? Much of it we have discussed it in the definitions of defamation. As we proceed with the explanation, I'm sure you're going to figure out much of the similarities in there. But again, for emphasis, we are just going to make it pinpoint and succinctly clear that when we are before the courts and we have to establish a claim of defamation, what are the elements that has to be proven by the claimant or the plaintiff in court so that he'll be successful in an action for defamation? That is what we are going to discuss in this video. So what are the elements of defamation? We'll go back to the famous case that we mentioned in the first part, the Ousu Domina versus Amwa case. A bit of the facts is this. Now, Osu Domna was a former employee of Mr. Amwa. Due to some issues that he had with the nature of his employment and conduct of his work, Amwa decided to terminate his appointment or dismiss him from work. Now, when he did that, he caused a publication to be made in the Daily Graphic to the effect that he, Osu Domna, was no longer an employee of the business of which Mr. Amwa owned. And therefore, anybody who kept on having dealings with Ousu Domna, was doing that at his own risk. That publication was also subsequently repeated for the second time. Now, Ousu Domna's view was that this statement or publication that Mr. Amwa had caused to be advertised in the Daily Graphic on two consecutive occasions was defamatory of him. That is, according to him, it had reduced him in the eyes of right-thinking members of the society generally. So the matter went to court where he had wanted to now push through his claim. It traveled to the Supreme Court. Now, I'll come to the conclusion that the Supreme Court gave. But the significant part for us in the Ousu Domina versus the Amwa case it is what the learned Justice Benin, JSE, as it then was, laid down as the elements for a claim or in an action of defamation. Now, there were five of those elements that he mentioned. So let's look at what Justice Benin said. JSE, as it then was, in the case of Ousu Domina versus Amwa, the five elements. One, there was a publication by the defendant. Two, the publication concerned him, the plaintiff. Three, the publication was capable of a defamatory meaning in its natural and ordinary sense. Four, alternatively, or in addition to III, that's the third part above, that from the facts and or circumstances surrounding the publication, it was defamatory of him, the plaintiff. And five, if the defendant sought the defense of qualified privilege or fair comment, that the defendant had been actuated by malice, and malice in such matters will be said to exist if there was spite or ill will on the part of the defendant or if the court found indirect or improper motive against the defendant in publishing the words complained of. 
You do see that. So in the Ousu Domina versus Zamwa case, the Apex Court, the Supreme Court, laid down the five ingredients, or what we say the elements of defamation. Amongst them, it mentions that there should have been a publication by the defendant. The publication should have concerned the plaintiff, that is the one who is now claiming that he has been defamed. And the nature of the publication will should be such that, in its natural and ordinary sense, it should be defamatory of him. Then it mentions that, in the alternative, or in addition to that, given the surrounding facts or circumstances, it is equally also defamatory. Then it mentions that, even if the person or the defendant is claiming the defense of qualified privilege or fair comment, the person was actuated by malice. These were the five pointers that were given as the elements of defamation. We are going to take our time and go through them elements one after the other. But now, you see, it is instructive at this juncture that we mentioned that the Ousu Domina versus Amwa case has actually also been adjusted by the Supreme Court, as we mentioned, in the latest case of the Benjamin Dufour versus the Bank of Ghana and the Graphic Communications Company Limited case, as per uh, her leadership, Professor Henrietta Jane Mensah Bonsu. She and the Apex Court has added to the earlier five pointers. So now we have six. Now the fifth pointer that has now been added to the decision or to the elements is that the defendant should have no defense. The defendant should have no defense. So actually now the key elements that the courts will look at, the law that has been laid down in Ghana for us is six. The first, again, being that there has been a publication by the defendant. Secondly, the publication should concern the plaintiff. Thirdly, the nature of the publication should be such that, in its natural and ordinary sense, it is defamatory of the person. Fourth, given the surrounding circumstances and facts, it could also be said to be defamatory of the person. Then, fifth, the defendant should have no defense. Then the sixth one comes that, even if he has a defense, and the defense is on qualified privilege or what, he, what is mentioned as fair comment, the person was actuated by malice. So as we are now going to discuss all the elements of defamation, keep in the back of your mind that in court, you now need to prove six of these elements to establish that the act of defamation is present. So let's take our time and see what these elements mean. The first, the publication must have been made by the defendant. So, the first element that has to be proven in an action for defamation in the law of thoughts in Ghana is that there should have been a publication by the defendant. What do we mean by that? A publication by the defendant. Now, you see, because the essence of defamation is that the reputation of the claimant, that is the person who is, who, who is peeved, who is alleging that he has been defamed, because his reputation is at stake, it is very necessary and imperative that in establishing an action for defamation, the person has to show that actually the defendant has published that statement to another person other than himself. So it cannot just be a two-way affair. That is Mr. A and Mr. B. Now, Mr. A is claiming defamation, an act of defamation by B, and his only statement is that B has insulted him, A. It doesn't work that way. There has to be a publication. The publication is that beyond A and B, B should have made the statement to another person, C, or class of persons, C. Okay? Such that it is the effect of the statement on the third person, C, that A is embittered about. So reputation, nature-wise, makes it very, very, very necessary that in an action for defamation, there has to be first the element of publication. This publication should have been done by the defendant to another person, at least one person who is different from the plaintiff. That is what we mean by the publication in there. Now, let's add this. The common law position and the courts have also held sometimes that because of sometimes social situations, some statements, even though that have been made to a third person, may not necessarily constitute an act of defamation. For example, let's say a husband and a wife. Mr. A, who is married to B, his wife. Now, there is a story about C. And A tells this story about C to his wife. C hears that. 
A has told the story about him C to the wife of A. So what happens? Is it possible for C to bring an action of defamation against A? That is to say that C is alleging that the statement that he A had made to his wife B was defamatory of him C. Generally, the law is that when you have husbands and wives in such domestic relations, statement that a man will say to his wife will not be defamatory of the person who is claiming that. So if, for example, um, I make a statement about you to my wife, you cannot bring an action against me that I have defamed you because I have told my wife. It doesn't work that way. Because the court is of the view that domestic relations make some of these things inevitable. You know, in our culture, many, many things a husband may tell his wife and vice versa, wife may. So when we talk about publication, these are some of the relations that take away that element of publication. But beyond that, generally, when the statement has been made to at least one person, other than the claimant, it can be classified as publication in the right sense. And also important to understand, in addition to this, is that the statement or the action that has been alleged to be defamatory, it should also be intelligible to the third person who has heard this matter, which means that if the person says it in a language that the third person understands, then we can also say that it is publication. So for example, let's say for the purpose of our exercise, we, have we are two Ga speaking people. I speak Ga, you speak Ga. Then there's a third person in the picture. Now I say something about you, but I say it in Ga to the hearing of the third person. The question is that if that third person doesn't understand Ga, even you who understand the Ga, you can't bring an action against me that I have defamed you because the subject matter was not intelligible to the third person. So we are saying that the statement, if it is by words, should be understood by that third person, said that we can, it can constitute publication. We, we get that. Then there is also um, publication in the sense of acts that may foreseeably or could have been reasonably anticipated to have happened. Let's take it in a business setting. Someone brings a letter, okay, about a particular employee. Let's say a director writes a letter, or a, a human resource manager, for example, in a company, writes a letter to the board of directors recommending the dismissal of one of the, um, one of the employees in the, in, the, in the place of work. Okay, he cites statements and, and puts in some kind of information that puts the person in a bad light. But of course, it is for the board of directors to see. Now he puts that letter, gives the letter to the secretary, and without proper regard, that letter leaks because of negligence by, let's say, for example, the human resource manager. That letter leaks, and the information that was containing as to the conduct of this employee, for which reason he was recommending his dismissal, now spreads to the rest of the members in the employment. Now the affected employee can bring an action against the management or against the human resource director for defamation. Why? Because that particular statement could be said could have been published by him, even though the HR manager didn't actually intend it going out. So what we are saying that if you are making a statement or you make a statement about a person, okay, to another person, it is defamatory. It could be defamatory in the sense of that it has been published. If the way the matter came out could also be attributed to your negligence or the negligence of the defendant. It could also be defamation. So let's say um, the same work setting. Sometimes you have conferences and meetings in rooms. Then maybe in the room, in one of the boardrooms, we are speaking, we are talking about one of the employees, we are discussing them. And one of them, one of the members who are in the room speaking, it's speaking on top of his voice in a way that he could have reasonably, or he should reasonably know that, the level or tenor of voice in which he is speaking, that information might be overheard by other employees in the workplace. Now, if that information goes out as a result of his careless manner of expressing himself, and the information gets to other employees, the, a person who is affected by that statement could actually also bring an action to claim that really the matter was published by him. You understand that? So this, this is the first one we are just trying to mention that when we say publication, this is the first element. The matter or the subject or the story that we are claiming that is defamatory 
of the claimant should have been published, spoken to at least one person other than the claimant. And we are saying that it could be direct or it could be as a result of negligence or carelessness um, that has occurred. So you may see that for practical purposes, sometimes in some companies or some business settings, when certain letters are written to people, it is tag confidential. If such a tag confidential is put on it, what it means is that apart from the person to whom the letter is directed, no one else has got the right to open it. Okay? So in situations like that happen, and through no fault of the person, the, the, the matter leaks out. It's, we don't say that the person has actually published it. So I think sufficiently the first point is very clear. There has to be a publication by the defendant. When that first element is satisfied, we'll now look at the other ones. Now, still sticking on the subject of publication, I just want to make a bit of um, an addition to matters that relate to the mass media. I mean, referring to newspapers and stuff. You know, as a student in an exam, sometimes some of these things could happen because you could have most of these defamatory statements or questions on defamation coming from issues about newspaper reportage and others, etc. So in the case of newspaper reportage or social media and all those things, which actually is the more contemporary form of communication, how does the subject of publication rear its head in a defamatory action in court? This is what we want to mean. You see, again, the first element is saying that there has to be a publication by the defendant. So what will constitute a publication? Now, the law is that any set of people along the chain who are involved in putting together the story of the claimant and brings it out, they are liable for publication. We can say that they are publishers. So the author, the editor, the one who prints it, in fact, the entire company crew, the company itself, could be said to be liable for defamation. So if, for example, a paper comes out, a newspaper report, report comes out on a front page, then it speaks about, let's say, um, a person, calling the person a thief. What happens? In publication, the editor and all those who were in there could be said to, uh, could be, said to be responsible for the publication. So if the person wants to bring an action for defamation, he targets the company itself. That is why many, many times, as you may find in our country, when people have got issues of defamation, the action is brought against the media house. Okay? Recently, there was a story in which um, a matter concerning a very prominent politician was being discussed on the TV by a couple of, um, um, let's say, um, social media influencers and stuff. He brought an action of defamation against the media house and those particular individuals. The subject is the person who allows or creates the platform for all that matter to be spun could be said to have published it. So that's just a bit of, of, of what we mean by publication by the defendant. It involves mass media. The media house could also be liable for um, an act of defamation in that regard. So for that, to that end, now let's move on to the, the other elements that has to be established in an action for defamation. Now, for the purpose of emphasis, we want to mention the second, third, and fourth elements, which we are going to take together. Now, you remember that in the second element that was established in the cases that we've mentioned by the Supreme Court, it said that this publication should concern the plaintiff. Then the third one says that it should be capable of a defamatory meaning in its natural and ordinary sense. Then the third mentions that alternatively, given the facts and the surrounding circumstances of the story, it should be defamatory of him. So the third, uh, the, the third part adds up. It mentions that alternatively or in addition to it, it should be capable of, of, of that. Hope you are fine. So we are going to take these two parts, to, this, this three parts together. Okay? Now, the first part, part that we want to speak about is where we are saying that the publication should concern the plaintiff. You see, what the person needs to establish in court in an action for defamation is that it has to be proven. It has to be proven that this statement that is being alleged to be defamatory was referenced to the claimant itself. Was referenced to the claimant. So the person needs to show that I have been defamed and I'm saying that because the story that was put out there, the statement that the person made to that third person, it was about me. 
it has to be clear in court or in the evidence that has been uh, that has to be brought before court to show. So how is that done? A couple of things. The person may even refer to the name that was used in there. That one, obviously, I know is very direct. So if someone speaks another, an, about another person, then he mentions his name straight away. Mr. A, he has done that. He's a thief. He is this. He is that. He is that. Statements that, as we know by the definition, lowers him in the eyes of right-thinking members. Once the name has been mentioned, and we know that he is the person, clearly, the reference to the plaintiff or the reference to the claimant has been established in there. It is also possible that the reference to the person could also be by his initials or an alias. You understand that? So if the person has a known initial, he has a known alias, an AKE, said that if you mention that AKE, all reasonable persons within the society, people who are familiar with that particular story, will know that he's the person you are referring to. We are saying that he'll be successful in proving that he, the, the, the matter refers to him. It could also be about an allegory or a hypothetical statement, a biblical allusion or anything of that sort. If it is possible that a reasonable mind, and again, that's the test, a reasonable mind, a person of general thinking, ordinary sense, within the society, okay, if the person hears our story and the person will know that this is the person you are referring to, we can say that a reference has been made. So let's take for example, some years ago here in Ghana, there was a, a, a kind of, a bit of a, an infamous or famous arm robber, Atai. I'm sure most of you might have heard him, but some of you still remember the name. Now, in the Ghanaian palace, Atai has, the name Atai is synonymous with robbery, a person who is a high profile thief or robber. So if someone calls another person, Atai, what do you think? What are people going to infer, the reasonable Ghanaian mind? What is the person going to feel about that statement that has been made about him? Okay, so we are saying that if it is possible that the statement, or the statement is such a nature that it is references to the person, then that particular um, requirement has been satisfied or discharged. Now the third and fourth part, which is of essence, it mentions that, it mentions that, the statement in its own natural and ordinary meaning should be defamatory. It should be capable of a defamatory meaning. Okay? And the fourth requirement says that, or alternatively, the surrounding facts of and circumstances should also make it possible for us to have that defamatory meaning in there. Now, these two things compensate for what we usually call an innuendo. Now, when we say an innuendo, what is an innuendo? You know, an innuendo is a statement that if the hearer of the statement gets the story, okay, like the hearer of the statement is able to correct some extrinsic facts and is able to say that no, this story that is being this story that is being peddled around, I think this is what it means. We call that an innuendo. We call that an innuendo. What let's say I may loosely call an indirect statement. You know, someone can make a statement on him, it's indirect. You don't mention his name. But if you are aware of the facts, you know that this is the person you are referring to. Okay, let's say, for example, you are in a, a, a place of employment, okay? Someone um, was, for example, let's say, caught in some other, some amorous relation. Let's say an officer was caught in an amorous relation with some other female employee in there. And the matter came up for disciplinary hearing due to in, maybe internal, in, internal controls or whatever in the company. And some other sanctions were applied, Okay. And this matter is known to many, many people in there. In a conversation, maybe at lunch time, then another person begins to make statements. Oh, as for me, I'm careful in this workplace that I am, oh, because I don't want to get myself involved with anybody, any female or any male, so that they call me and they will sanction me. Me there, I don't want trouble. Now, question. If someone hears a statement in that particular employment and the person is familiar with these extrinsic facts, what do you think the person is going to think? Clearly, the person will see that the statement that's being made is referencing one person. Hope you understand that. That's what I mean by an innuendo. Okay. So the courts is saying that 
when there are surrounding facts, okay, surrounding facts or surrounding circumstances, under which a person will clearly impute that this statement that we are saying is being referenced to another person, we can either construe that to be defamatory in meaning. Okay, so in a newspaper reportage or maybe in a broadcast, you may not necessarily have to mention someone's name. We don't necessarily have to mention his name. If the statement that you are making will just leave a distinct impression on the minds of the audience that mm, this matter that you are speaking about, it can only refer to one and just one person. The law says that that is an innuendo and it's possible that an, a, an action for defamation can be brought in that regard. Then the third part, as the justices had mentioned, was that it should be capable of a defamatory meaning in its natural and ordinary sense. That is, you may not need any special interpretation to bring that matter up. Remember we mentioned the case of the, uh, the, the Benjamin Dufour case, where the Supreme Court had to pronounce on it. This was one of the considerations. Again, Benjamin Dufour was saying that his appointment had been terminated and graphic communication had reported that he had been dismissed. The Supreme Court was of the view that if they, they, they failed to use the word terminate and dismiss, would it naturally strike someone in his mind that, oh, this person has actually done something wrong? I mean, can someone just clearly make that kind of distinction? So if it will not be so apparent to the fellow, we don't think that in its natural sense it is capable of a defamatory meaning. So basically, these three things go together, okay? For that, the publication should concern the plaintiff. It should be capable of a defamatory meaning in its natural and ordinary sense. Then again, the surrounding circumstances and facts of the matter should be such that it was defamatory of the plaintiff. So these three things go together. Hope you understand that. It is important to note that when we discuss these particular three elements here, the second, third, and fourth. It is also within the perspective of the reasonable man. The reasonable man. So the society where that particular statement was made and the feelings and attributes of the persons within that community would go a long way to determine whether that particular statement will be defamatory in that matter or not. For purposes of examination, if it is your LLB level that you are doing the law of thoughts on defamation, or perhaps you are preparing for your law entrance exam. If a question pops up on defamation, it is important that you keep an eye on, on the third person, the class of persons who have heard this statement, this alleged defamatory statement. Who are they? Are they of the reasonable man that we speak about? Are they general right-thinking members of the society? Because if they are a specialized group, who would have some kind of specialized or enhanced thinking, then the assessment will be a bit different. So that is the, the key part. Now, it is important to note that in our third and fourth, it is not what the person intends. It is how the third person feels about it. You understand that? So basically, that's just what we are trying to say when we're talking about the elements of defamation. So we've mentioned the first part. We explained extensively that there has to be a publication by the defendant, and we explain what the publication means. It should be intelligible, to the, the third person in a language that the person would construe and also understand. And we always look at the variations that come in if it is within the mass media or newspaper reportage. Then we'll look at the second part, that the publication should concern the plaintiff, is that he may, his name may not be directly mentioned, but the surrounding circumstances or facts should be such that it is possible that you either directly know that he's a person or you can clearly just infer that it is this person that we are referring to. Then again, it mentions that the statement should be capable of being defamatory in its natural and ordinary sense. We also include the implication. We also include the implication. So any other inference that could be drawn from the statement should be reasonably and naturally capable of being defamatory in, 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 in meaning. Okay. So these four um, elements are what... Um, we can say that it constitutes um, um, the elements that has to be established when a matter comes to court in an action for defamation. Now, I intentionally reserve the fifth and sixth part, and I'm going to discuss that in the third video. Why? Because now the justices have said, or the rules or the law says that the person should have no defense. 
The defendant should have no defense. That's the fifth point that we've mentioned. Then number six says that even if the defense is on qualified privilege or fair comment, the person should have been actuated by malice. Simply put, point five and point six of the elements focus on the defenses in defamation. And I want to reserve that in our next video when we talk about the defenses of an action in defamation. If someone alleges that you have defamed him or another person has defamed him, what are some of the reasons that this defendant could prefer so that he can also fight back in a claim against defamation? That we will discuss vis-a-vis point -vis five and point six. But at this juncture, I think we've discharged our burden on the first, second, third, fourth reasons. Stay tuned for the fifth and sixth reason that will cover the defenses in an action for defamation.